Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Both, joined by Derek Young. And this time on a Thursday instead of a Friday, we get ready to preview K-State and Arizona, a Friday night showdown on Fox, a part of Fox's new Friday night package that they are putting together this season. This is the first one that they're doing uh, this year. We have kind of found out in full when this thing came about uh, at the end of March was when the, or excuse me, I think it was May actually, where we got uh, the actual announcement of it earlier though, in the spring, we got the football schedule and pretty much instantly knew when we saw that there was the uh, or designation for K-State Arizona, that it was going to be a Friday game. And it was. So if you're confused about K-State and Arizona and why they're playing on a Friday, it's because Fox and the big 12, wants it to happen in this primetime slot. And if you go through the the rest of the schedule, there is only one other non-Big Ten game in this slot this year, and it is Utah and UCF on Black Friday. And again, there are different circumstances to that. So K-State, Arizona getting the same billing that Illinois, Nebraska is going to get next week, which all of a sudden, as long as Illinois takes care of business with uh, Central Michigan this weekend, it's going to be kind of a fascinating game to see Illinois going to Lincoln. And then that is followed up by Washington and Oregon. Oregon's on it a couple times. USC, UCLA plays a couple of them, uh, as does Iowa, I believe. So they put their bigger properties that they're interested in in this slot. And K-State Arizona was big enough to kind of crack the Big Ten bubble at least for a week for the Big 12. So that's what we get ready to preview for you right here today on the KSO Show. But before we do that, a reminder that K-State is gearing up to fly on overseas. They're going to head to Ireland for the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. And you can join your Wildcats as they kick off the 2025 football season against Iowa State. Game tickets can be secured now through a travel or hospitality package. All-inclusive travel packages include premium game tickets, luxury hotel accommodations, and exclusive K-State welcome experience and more. Game day hospitality packages include premium in-stadium hospitality with food and drinks and premium game tickets. Don't miss out on the trip of a lifetime. Book your package now at cats2ireland.com. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. So we can get started with uh, what everybody's really here for, and that is K-State and Arizona, a top 20 matchup at Bill Snyder Family Stadium. First one in a decade. The last one was that game with number 20 K-State, number five Auburn. Also on a weeknight back in 2014 where Auburn was able to win by a score. K-State hopes that this goes much differently. And the Wildcats are looking for their first weeknight victory in the regular season since the 2010 season when they beat KU in Lawrence on a Thursday night. Uh, So it's been a long, long time, almost 14 full years since K-State has gotten the job done. Uh, We'll get to our predictions later on, but what do you expect from K-State in this Friday night environment, D.Y.? A lot more energy, a lot more juice, uh, and a better start. Those would be the things that I kind of almost anticipate a little bit. Uh, they, they've they been mired by slow starts probably a little bit. Well, definitely on both sides of the ball against Tulane and, and definitely on offense against UT Martin. And, and then just starting drives. So not just starting the game, but also starting drives. I think those have been issues for the Wildcats. That's why they had all the three and outs that they did against the Green Wave. So uh, a little bit more juice, a little bit more energy, and a better start. Uh, it sounds like practices have, have gone really well this week, which wasn't necessarily so last week against Tulane, according to Coach Kleiman. Yeah, and, and last last week, I guess, I mean, it, it would have ended up being – uh, on Friday when or Saturday when he said it after the game, but he just kind of explained it wasn't because guys didn't bring the energy or they weren't focused or whatever, but they just didn't execute throughout the week, which Sloppy. he said may have been the worst type of bad practice you can have because if you can't execute in practice, then you have a tough time being able to actually go out and execute in a game. And I think there are a bunch of different factors as to why uh, that could be changed this week. And again, we saw positive flashes in the game against Tulane. I mean, I don't think you can complain about anything the offense did in the second half in terms of how the players on the field performed. I think, again, that goes into back into that area where we can talk about with Connor Riley. I don't think Connor Riley is a bad offensive coordinator in terms of 
coming up with knowing what he needs to do or how to set up plays. But I do think that there are times where he's still trying to figure out, okay, in this moment, this is how I need to string together this set of plays. And and we saw that, I think, probably the biggest example is, number one, the starts to games. K-State's been just having to punt, which is not good. But the bigger one was when K-State got the ball, they got the stop, they were up seven, and they go three and out, and the first two plays are just these basic runs where you felt like you got to give a little bit more there. Yeah, I think he's, I think, well, in that case, I think he just thought, you know, we're running the ball well. I'll go, so we're going to, I'm going to use what we're doing well to try to win this game. Uh, not necessarily, m- maybe a little bit more creativity would have been nice um, on that. Maybe I agree, uh, but, but I think he wanted, he wanted to put that game on his offensive line. I'm not sure they're at a point where you can do that yet either. So, and I've said this in other places. I'm certainly not the only one saying it. And I know Fan has as well. He's also, that being Connor Riley, figuring out what this particular offensive unit's going to be good at as well. Like I remember he's a new coach and you got a lot of new or you know a good amount of first time contributors. So you're finding out what they're going to be good at collectively. So uh you're running out a little bit of time now, but we're in the process of figuring out their identity. Uh, but being able to win over a pretty solid team in Tulane while still doing that is good. I think you probably want it at the latest. You want it figured out your identity figured out by, you know, when you play Oklahoma state probably. Um, but you know, obviously the sooner the better, you'd love to have it by the BYU game as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it takes time. People don't, want it to take time because that can be kind of frustrating and and you don't have what feels like a ton of it because of the way that the season starts out with Arizona in this game. But big picture, even though it it wouldn't be fun and you don't want the drop off, this game in the grand scheme of things doesn't mean all that much for K-State because we know that really the Big 12 is probably going to have to win the conference title to get in. This doesn't count the conference record. It could mean more for Kansas State just because they're one of maybe three teams in the Big 12 that I think has an outside shot at an at-large to go to the college football playoff. And even some of the big brand, big conference guys have admitted that. Like Bud Elliott from Cover 3, mm-hmm. he's kind of a big brand, big conference guy. And even he has put some stock into that, assuming everything goes to form, like Kansas State, like if they they go basically 12 and 0 and then losing Arlington, they would be a candidate to be an at large team. Well, and the best example of that, I guess would be that I mean, K-State's 14th in the country right now in the AP poll. That's significant to be at that stage in week three. If you think back to last year, I mean, I, people were probably pretty pleased last year that week three going into the Missouri game, they were number 15. They're higher than that this season with where they sit. And if they continue to stack up the wins, they'll be in that same position to where, I mean, we're essentially TCU got to where, they could lose that conference title game and still have their spot secured because of everything else they did. And their schedule gives them the resume to do that more so than like the other Big 12 teams. Now, to be honest, Iowa State is probably in that boat. Now, I don't think Iowa State's going to go undefeated, but having a win over Iowa Iowa, and now maybe Iowa doing something, that would put Iowa State in the same boat. So I'm there on that. Utah probably can just because of their reputation almost. Uh, but that they don't really have the non-conference to boost them. Like Kansas State, just like obviously, let's just throw out the scenario. Like they beat Arizona, hypothetically, they beat Arizona. What if Arizona goes on and has a really good year? Um, so you're going to get your nine conference wins in this scenario that we're talking about, hypothetical. You're, you're going to get your nine conference wins and have a really good win over Arizona and potentially a really good win over Tulane because yeah. I think they're going to be a factor in the group of five race. Yeah, Tulane, I mean, they would have obviously gotten more from the win, but I think even from the way they played that game, um, honestly, K-State might have threaded a needle there that you didn't necessarily want to thread, but that game playing out the way that it did might ultimately end up helping you in the end because it gave Tulane a lot of respect for the way that they're set up. You might have to have Tulane beat Oklahoma because I don't know if they get in with two losses. Yeah, true. 
Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, go go Green Wave uh this weekend. We'll see how that works out. That'll for be an interesting game. I'm in very Norman. intrigued to watch it. Yep. Yeah. I mean Oklahoma similar boat to K State, although I K State's offense is in a better spot than Oklahoma's offense right now. Uh, but the Sooners probably need to get their offense figured out in a hurry right now. And they just they also just lost their offensive coordinator. So yeah, and uh, not I, much of a surprise there. And uh, replaced him with an old friend, Seth Luttrell. Um, funny how things come come back around. Of and we know that he's had a great resume over the last three yeah. years. What I one other thing I wanted to like cover there that kind of came to mind that I didn't get out yet is that I'm not saying I'm not trying to draw complete parallels here, but this start for Connor Riley, has, excuse me, hasn't been too dissimilar to Colin Klein's start in 2022. Go back and look yeah. if, for folks that don't remember what Kansas State was doing. And obviously they turned out and won the Big 12 championship, but against South Dakota, Missouri, and Tulane, they lost. That was ugly. I mean, go back and look at that offensive stuff. I mean, you guys remember it. They got nothing going against Tulane. They lost that game because they were an offensive disaster. They were able to use the monsoon as an excuse so that even if their offense was collecting, it probably wasn't going to work against Missouri because that that was just a miserable game. And I think they just relied on the running game, of course. But, I mean, they scored 40 points, I think, but it didn't feel yeah. like they scored 40 points. In, in South Dakota, that was uh, that was like grinding teeth to get to 34. Yeah. Well, and yeah, and you think about b- both of those first two games, I mean, they got the – the in around to start, easy touchdown first play for Malik Knowles. So there was seven instantly. Phillip Brooks had the punt return against Missouri. So those were games that if you kind of dive into it, um, the offense was a lot less a part of that story than what it necessarily needed to be. And you did have a combo there where like there were certain things that had to be, I think, reiterated and coached back into Adrian Martinez. I, so I guess if we're talking parallels to 2022, is there anything in Avery Johnson's game right now that needs to be coached back into him or explained, hey, st- you can step up and do this. Like we we know that you can, as opposed to just be a little bit looser. Cause I think it's just been, I think he's been a little tight with some of the things. Like we know that some of the throws he's missed on, he can make those throws. And we saw him make those last year in games that he played in. A little tight, especially in week one or and just maybe gets a little like he just needs experience so everything kind of slows down a little bit more i think it's different from what it, where it was with adrian martinez in 2022 where i think the game had slowed down for him but he had to trust what he was seeing a little bit more for avery johnson i think it's just game reps game experience um and obviously you know it's kind of been something that's been mentioned a lot uh kind of the catchphrase of the week is like finding your rhythm finding your groove you know I think that's important because when that happens in each of the games in the second half, this thing has looked pretty good. So I don't think there's parallels in that regard. I just think Avery needs to calm down, slow down. Um, game reps will will solve that. So that's where I feel like that's where that is. In 2022, they finally had that coming out party against Oklahoma and Norman. So you know, it feels like at some point we're going to get that because this offense is too talented for that not to happen. And maybe it happens this week, but the difference being that offense was still pretty old and experienced. So I think it came together maybe a little bit faster than this one might, but this one's so much more uh, potentially explosive. Like that one didn't have, yeah. you know, the, the, the Dylan Edwards pop, the Avery Johnson pop, um, the, the, upward potential of the receivers they still haven't realized it but i i I just think there's a little bit more pop potential with this offense than even that one um that doesn't mean that they'll get to it soon these guys are fairly young um and haven't played a lot of college football together and 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 now you're banged up a little on the offensive line too well and we talked about this uh on the sunday show a couple of weeks ago after the first game but even though it was kind of a slow start, not necessarily what you're looking for. The offense did eventually find a rhythm where they had four straight drives with the number ones out there where they, they scored the last two were touchdowns, similar story to the two lane game where they came out and they didn't score on that first drive, the second half, but then they went field goal, touchdown, touchdown. 
And even more significant than what they did in the UT Martin game, because like you knew against UT Martin, they weren't going to score or do anything to threaten there. But the most impressive part about what they did against Tulane was number one, they came out and the defense afforded them the opportunity to, you know, get kind of a mole again after they didn't score on the first drive, but they get the field goal. They get a stop from their defense and they go out and they tie it up in five plays. And they well, did. so they tied the game and then they had to come back and answer their next possession offensively because Tulane had taken the lead back and they did it in six plays. So they like it wasn't just a oh we've got our rhythm now and now we're going to roll and kick their butt. They were still having to go out there with that little feeling in the back of their head that oh man if we have to get something here because if we don't then this game it's over and it's on us for not answering. Which then kind of ties back into me. Some of the things we talked about last year where you think about that Missouri game where people wanted to put some of it on the defense, totally fair at times, but the offense had more than enough opportunities to kind of prove themselves in the Missouri game. They didn't Oklahoma come State. through. Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. State, same type of deal. Texas they just didn't Lake, come through. Yeah. Texas Lake, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, Iowa State, like I felt yeah, like – I don't blame the, the offense for the they, Iowa they State were scoring. Game. They were scoring almost every possession. Yeah. And, and that's a good point to bring up because what they did at, against Tulane in New Orleans, I, and obviously people didn't love it at the, in, the, in the moment, but – Coming back and answering, like you said, doing what they did, those second half scores, finding that rhythm and groove when there was real game pressure, that that does that's not something to gloss over. You basically have a an offensive roster that is significantly low on experience, and in the tight game with game pressure against a good defense and a good coach. Um, to rise to the occasion, that situation is pretty significant. I like that you pointed that out. Yeah. All right. You mentioned offensively might be even tougher now to figure some things out because the offensive line got a little bit banged up, which is something I don't know. In the in the flow and moment of the game, did you realize that there was an injury no. thing going on, or was it not until I remember Carver Willis leaving the field and and returning? The Hadley Panzer one I kind of missed, so that's on. That's on me to be honest. I, I didn't I didn't realize that there was an injury thing until well, they, I think until the Monday. Way, because the way they rotate, mm -hmm. that's interesting. It's it, it, it's hard to sometimes detect it because it's like you know that could just be what a normal rotation was. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean looking back on it now, I realize that John Pastore did play a lot more than what we anticipated or accustomed seeing. So. I mean, it sounds like Willis is going to play a lot. It feels like Hadley Panzer is a lot less likely. Yeah. Oh, so in terms of the offensive line injuries, what are your expectations there? And a lot more line game. Yeah. I mean, how impactful is it that you may be without Hadley Panzer for this game or anybody being limited that it, it sounds like it could be trending? Yeah. I mean, it's almost, you never want to lose people, right? That, that's part of it. What I will say is Andrew Lange is really freaking good. He might he might be their best lineman through two weeks, and now he's going to play more. Not sure that's a totally bad thing. It'll be interesting to see. Just kind of uh, one thing to note. All right. Uh, in terms of what K State will be seeing from Arizona, uh, is there anything that you think K State will stick with offense right now, and then we'll get into what the defense has on their hands because that could get messy and ugly uh, in a lot of yeah. different ways. Yeah. Uh, in terms of K State's offense versus versus Arizona's defense. What do you expect here? Because just like we'll talk about with the Arizona offense, but the the tale of two games for Arizona through the first two weeks of the season against not very good opponents makes them kind of a nightmare to figure out. A little bit, yeah. And Here's something I'll say, too, and I know we're giving Arizona a lot of respect, and, and for the most part, they deserve it. This is a good program with a lot of great talent. They got, what, three or four guys that are projected to go in the first two or three rounds of the NFL draft. I mean, they got high end talent with that being said it is a brand new coaching staff in a brand new league having to go on the road on a friday night and and i know they were at home last week but they played you know at night so they already lo lost that time well k state even though they were on the road did get the 11 a.m kick and i wonder if there's a little something to that especially on a short week they are also banged up on the offensive line as well and they've 
they do have the liberty of moving around a guy that could go in the first round, obviously, and Jonah Savanaya, a really good offensive lineman. So a hard team to figure out, but they played two, I would say, by their standards, by of their talent, as I've just laid out, two lackluster games against two teams that would probably get boat raced by Tulane. So that's something to consider. Yeah, they, I, they, they're not the strongest opponents, and they've been susceptible at times. Uh, thinking about where K-State might try to attack here. If, if you were in charge of this offense, I, I'll probably be asking you this question every single week until we feel like K-State's offense is in a comfortable spot. But uh, in your eyes, you can be very basic with it. How would you start this game and try to attack Maybe not even just Arizona specifically, but how you would handle uh, trying to get this K State offense going to where that first drive doesn't end with a punt within like five or six plays, and you're thinking about scoring to start the game. Yeah, that's interesting. I might, it makes me kind of want to come out throwing, even though the best thing about this offense has been DJ Giddens. And, but, but I also think about like uh, who's Arizona's best player cornered to Cario Davis on that side of the ball, in my opinion. Um, Jacob Manu is also a pretty good linebacker. They have good individual talent, but that defense has also been very susceptible. Something to keep in mind is the Dan Peer, the quarterback for New Mexico, uh, in terms of a skill set or, or stylistically, probably a little bit or a close reflection of Avery Johnson. A very, a very mobile, dual threat guy, and Brent Brennan said the difference being that Avery Johnson's a lot faster than Dampier, even though Dampier can move, and that Avery Johnson's probably a more complete thrower. And Dampier gutted Arizona for about three quarters, so that is something to keep in mind. So, with that being said, I guess if you said generality, I want to use Avery's arm and legs, uh, get him moving. He's really good out of the pocket. I do want to, like you said, I better start because I, I do think this offense has probably has a chance to be pretty streaky. Um, they're going to have their cold spells, but I think they'll have their hot spells because of all the talent. And I think that's coming at some point, but they're so, and they can get really explosive. So I think they need a little bit of tempo. So they start to, you know, you know feel themselves out a little bit. So, you know, I would throw in some Avery runs early um, and soften that defense up a little bit to, and make them honor that threat right out of the gate. So it's something they have to keep in mind for a full 60 minutes. And not that I want to, you know, hurt, get Avery hurt. You got to be smart with it. But I do think this is kind of the game where you kind of unwind that weapon a little bit. And I, I would like to see the tempo because a little bit more tempo, I think, helps you get into a rhythm and helps you get into a groove. Also gives you more snaps and more opportunities to get the ball to guys like Dylan Edwards and Keegan Johnson. Because I, I really liked what I saw from Keegan Johnson in week two, and I hope that's a launching point for him. Yeah, it was a it was a good week, week two for Keegan Johnson, and now you just hope that he can kind of build off that. Okay, let's move on to the defense. It was sloppy. It was scary. It was ugly against Tulane, but it shouldn't be lost that if you dive into it, like they kind of tried sandwiching in there about what we expected from the K-State defense because Tulane turned it over on downs on their first possession. They got a little deep, got a few big plays, maybe a precursor of what was to come. Then they punted on five plays to start, and then they started the second half with two three and outs, uh, and then ultimately K-State's defense down the stretch run was able to force a punt uh, in between the fumble that was taken for a touchdown and then the interception to win the game. So they made some big plays when it counted, but the middle portion of the game, they got shredded, and Arizona has two guys that they could really shred you with Noah Fafita at quarterback and Ted Aroa McMillan at wide receiver. So what's your expectation of the K-State defense versus Arizona offense on Friday? Well, you have to pay a lot of attention to, to Ted Aroa McMillan. Um, obviously, he didn't really get going against Northern Arizona. I don't. That one's a weird one to him for him to come out of there for only two catches and 11 yards is wild to me because they literally almost it felt like they were force feeding him the ball on every single play in the prior week against New Mexico. So 
Uh, we talk about tail two has it's like a tail two games. He is really good. I imagine Arizona will probably look a little bit more like week one, where they basically force feed the ball to Tedaroa McMillan. So you got you got to have a scheme and a plan for that, which kind of gives me a little a good bet here. I'll, not it's not it's not in my best bets for for those waiting for those. But that other receiver for Arizona, which I think is Montana Lamonius Craig, mm-hmm. uh, it would not surprise me if he has a big game because Kansas State has to pay so much attention to Tedaroa McMillan. What I will say here is there is a world, there is a universe where Kansas State is significantly better on defense and Arizona still gets theirs because they're that good on offense. Okay, so thinking about everything that we know going into this game and what we thought we knew about uh, about K-State's pass rush after game one, which maybe was silly by everybody to uh, think, oh, hey, UT Martin, you just dominated them up front. But K-State was still able to manage uh, a good – number of sacks in the game against Tulane and I thought at times the pressure was good enough to impact plays that were made do you think K-State will be able to get to Noah Fafita because he's not the most mobile guy which I think would surprise some people to hear Um, so what probably the biggest key for K-State's defense in addition to just you know if you're a defensive back try to keep within 20 yards of a receiver this game is getting to the quarterback do you think that's something that K-State will be able to manage against uh, an Arizona offensive line that is banged up in a couple of areas as well, uh, but is you know pretty veteran for the most part? Yeah, they're older, but they do have two replacement players that are likely going to be at center and right guard, it sounds like. So that, that'll be interesting if that's maybe the area you choose to attack, at least test it to see if those guys are, are up to the challenge. They're ready. The problem for Kansas State last week, is that they were able to generate a pass rush when they sent quite a bit of extra pressure, but they couldn't get home with just three, uh, like they did against UT Martin. And I, I don't know if I said it on this show, but I definitely wrote about it. Not that I said it was a concern, but a question I had was with what Toby Osinsami did against UT Martin, was that going to be translated to the better teams on the schedule where his blend of speed, explosiveness, and size and strength, like where that is a significant advantage for him against someone like UT Martin, you'll go up against Tulane in Arizona. That advantage kind of withers away. Those guys see see that a little bit. Those teams are talented enough to kind of be able to handle that. That's not an FCS school. That's one of the best G5 programs in America. That's a Big 12 program. So hopefully it's a fluke, but I kind of think we got our answer there that until he polishes game and becomes a little bit more of a complete player, just that raw athleticism for Toby is not always going to be enough. Yeah. All right. We'll pause on K-State Arizona. We'll get back to it with our MVP picks and our predictions for the game, but we'll move on now into our best bets where uh, after last week it went about as I predicted it would. We are now tied at three and three in the early going of the season. Here's the recap. From last week, I went uh, one and two with Texas getting me off to a hot start. KU and Texas Tech both fell flat on their faces. Uh, I don't know who had the worst weekend. Probably Texas Tech fans because there really wasn't a way to justify what happened. Uh, And then BYU got you off to a hot start Friday night. Michigan Michigan offense as bad as advertised. And Oregon about got you a three and a week. A bad beat by Oregon. Uh, BYU to cover the 10 and a half and went out right. That's a major one. I should have just went BYU money line. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, Michigan never really, I know they finished with what, 12 points, I mm-hmm. think, but it never felt like they were going to get to that 16 and a half. So that never felt in danger. Uh, BYU 10 and a half never really felt in danger either, to be quite honest. It was yeah. just, a, it was just a matter of if they were going to win that game or not for you, especially U- since SMU couldn't score a touchdown in the game. <laughs> For you, Texas, that one felt that one looked like it was going to cover from yeah. start to finish. That was not a problem. Kansas looked like they were in for a fight of their life all game, so they could have covered that if they had won. So that one wasn't like a terrible pick. Not that it was a terrible pick, but Texas Tech did do no favors. Like oh, I'll, I'll yeah. be honest, if I'm a, you're right. If I'm a Red Raider fan, I'm feeling the worst because not only did we have to go to overtime and win by one against. Abilene Christian the week before, like they didn't even fight back or put up 
any fight against Washington State at any point in that game. They looked like they wanted to be somewhere else the entire time. Yeah, that it's a it's not a good sign for Texas Tech because I my whole thing was just banking on that kind of being a bounce back from I Tech does not have the talent on their team to be as bad as they have played. No. But the fact that they didn't show up for that, there's a problem there somewhere, whether it's the mentality or personality of the players, or it, you know, you can go up the flag to the coaching staff and put it on them. So uh, Texas Tech is in some uh, dangerous but, spots. Yeah. Where where's the leadership? That would be my question. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's tough. They don't ever have a quarterback for the same three games in a because, row. So. I mean, think about it. Like, they just did not put up a fight. They got down early against Washington State and basically just gave up. It's like the opposite of what we're saying about Kansas State, why we were so impressed that they were able to come back and figure out a win. That's like a tale of two different sides of leadership there where it's yeah. not existent in Lubbock. Kansas State goes and probably beats a better team. Uh, Tulane might be better than Washington State. On the road while down by – 14-3, 20 to 10, just no fight, just kept plugging away. Well, and it's a little scary if I was a if I was a Texas Tech fan that in the first two games of the season, um, that you, you've gone away from running the football as easily. And I know that Taj Brooks did not play against Washington State. He was hurt. But the fact that Baron Morton threw the ball 58 times in that game, that's just not early. the way to do it. Like they abandoned, they abandoned the run game when they got down early. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, they they put themselves in a in a big hole. It was a twenty point second quarter for Washington, I mean, State. and that's probably the formula to beat Texas Tech. They're like, oh, this team, if they have to throw it, they're not going to win. Jump yeah. on them early and make them throw it. All right, let's move on. Get into our week three best bets now. Uh, look, I'm going to the Michigan. Well, Michigan has been a part of best bets, I believe, for. <laughs> Uh, like three straight weeks now. I took Fresno State to cover in week one. You took, well, we both had Michigan involved last week. This week, I think that they're going to flip the script. Uh, they get Arkansas State in a get-right game at 11 a.m. on, on a Big Ten Network. Here's what Arkansas State has done this year, D.Y. They won by a field goal over Central Arkansas, an FCS opponent uh, that K-State has met before. And in that game against Central Arkansas, they led 13 nothing at halftime. They allowed the Bears to score 31 points in the second half and 21 of them in the fourth quarter. So I think the Wolverines get right. I'm also taking another big line, Alabama on the road at Wisconsin. Alabama very much played with their food last weekend. I don't know that they're great, but Wisconsin's not very good either. Wisconsin's pretty bad, actually. Uh, so I think Alabama, they'll be motivated. They'll step up, and uh, they'll be ready to go. And then I, everybody's been hating on them all year at KSO except for me. The Sun Devils on Thursday night, so tonight when you're watching this most likely, or if you're you know in the car on the way to the game Friday, you already know the outcome. I am taking Kenny Dillingham and Cam Scadaboo minus the one and a half in San Marcos on Thursday. And for those that would want to tail that, just take the money line if you're going to do that. That's what I would encourage if you feel that way. I, I, I'm going to, I'm dumb and I'm, I'm, I'm betting against them again this week. <laughs> so maybe the third time is a charm. We'll, we'll see what happens. I like your thought process on Michigan. I'm still worried that they, they can score, score 23 points. <laughs> I'm still worried if they could score enough to cover that. Yes. Uh, I ho hopefully they get a pick six to really boost it and yeah. uh, help now, things out. They could get a shutout. They, they, they could do it the Iowa way and cover just by doing the shutout. So yeah. that would not surprise me. I agree Wisconsin's not good. I'm just – I don't know that I feel good about Alabama yet. Yeah, I just – I. I, I think that there's too much there that they'll be able to kind of get it figured out. Uh, and it, again, that's just another one where it's, I'm so down on Wisconsin mm -hmm. and it's tough for me, even though Nick Saban isn't there and everything else that you have a team with the same quarterback that ended up in the playoff last year. And it's Alabama that they're not going to be able to take care of business. Uh, I did consider another massive line in this one, Georgia minus 24 and a half against Kentucky. Oh, uh, yeah, I but was, that's a weird I spot with Georgia on the road, Kentucky was so bad last week uh, that maybe something wacky would happen. So I didn't want to mess with that one. I was actually um, leading Kentucky on that. Just the, just the, the spot really. Yeah, exactly. The, the logic there, it's like, yeah, I mean, just reverse logic on how yeah. you would uh, kind of go about it, but I'm, I'm with you 
on that one. There are there are a lot of tricky games this week. Even if you're just looking around there's in terms not, of there's a lot of big spreads because there's not a lot of good games. That's yeah. the issue. Um, I want LSU minus seven, as you see, if you're watching on YouTube. Look, so we just talked about that game. South Carolina yeah. blew the doors off Kentucky. I I think that's making people really much overreact to South Carolina. And LSU's had two bad weeks in a row, despite yeah. beating Nichols last week. LSU played with their food against Nichols. South Carolina is not that good. Like I think that's an overreaction. I also think LSU is being penalized and indicted for losing to a USC team that might be pretty good. Like if you give Lincoln Riley a defense, um, USC is going to win a lot of games. So that's what that looked like to me. So I'm not going to crush LSU for for what they did against USC. That might be a good team that they played in Las Vegas. So LSU minus seven is probably my favorite one. I, I think that one may end up covering pretty easily. Tulane, Oklahoma under 50. Unfortunately, if you're hoping to get on that now, you can't. As I got it out of the shoot at 50, I think that's because I thought that was way too high. Apparently, everybody else does too because that's already <laughs> been bet down to 46 and a half. Yeah, that seems that. Yeah, that that that's where uh, if I were you, I'd be trying to thread the needle there and take Go the over, over then. Over 40, yeah. yeah. That, that it came out to 50. I was like, there's no way with the way that Oklahoma offense looks, yeah. the way that Tulane will probably approach that game. Tulane's defense is solid and will only get better as the year goes on because John Summerall is kind of a defensive guy. I think Tulane having to empty the clip and basically do what they did to try to beat Kansas State puts everything on film for an Oklahoma team that is definitely defensive oriented at this stage. You got a good head coach that. I don't know if he's a good head coach, but he got a head coach that's a really good defensive guy and Brent Venables. I I see that as a very low scoring game. That that it came out 50, I was like, that's wild. Also, one that I really, really like, just like the LSU. Had a hard time finding anything else. You're right. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot else that I loved. I'm so down on TCU that I took UCF minus two and a half. I can't say that I love it, but that's another one that I kind of felt good about. So I went with it like, cause I, for a best bet, I wasn't going to go against Arizona state again. Like I'm not, well, and, uh, and, and I, I like Cincinnati two and a half, but it's like, cause I think Cincinnati should be able to be my Ohio by three points. And if they can't, they but got on the of, road, they got, they got a lot of shit coming for them. Now they lost to my Ohio at home last year. I realized yeah. that, but like, I don't know. I'm like, you're a big 12 team beat my Ohio by three points. If they can't, they probably are really, really bad. And even if they can, they're probably still really, really bad. Yeah. Uh, UCF, I think TCU, did TCU even open up as a, as the favorite in that game in some places, I think. Oh, maybe. Uh, there I may have it. been a possibility of that. But yeah, I, I like UCF in that spot as well. Even if there are concerns about KJ Jefferson, uh, I think UCF is good enough. I just, I'm really down on TCU. Yeah. So. Well, and, and I and think I UCF you are too. You think Sunny Dykes is a fraud? So yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right about that. So uh, I we'll get to the K State one. I guess I'm just kind of going through it. Yeah, the, K, yeah. the KU over, kind of like that. UNLV KU over 57 and a half. I think that's been bet up even more. It was too much of a sicko bet, and I hate taking big underdogs. But what I actually really liked was UTSA, who I think is a pretty good team, even though they got exposed last week against Texas State. They're playing a Texas team that's kind of pie in the sky here uh, ready for you know earth to come come back down to earth a little bit utsa plus 35 i think that's a lot of points yeah one that i i i I mean it's just such a toss-up so you could try and do something with it and act like you're the smartest person in the world is that texas a&m florida game i think you could talk yourself one way or the other into why one team will get the good outcome there why florida could win it and also why a&m could cover the three and a half. Um, I, t- I took Florida under on their team total of 20 and a half. Probably smart. I mean, the the, the total for the game is 46 and a half. I don't know I, that anybody. I, I think a probably going to be better defensively this year than they are on offense. I think that obviously, yeah. I don't think I'm breaking any news there. They have quarterback problems, at least it looked like in week one. But Elko knows defense and Florida. I think their offense is still going to sputter against really good teams. Yeah, it'll be fascinating to uh, kind of see. All right, I didn't, I didn't put them up there this week. Uh, your K State best bet, you, uh, you, you sent it, and I was not overly surprised by it, but uh, I've got thoughts on it once you share it with everybody. Yeah, it's over fifty nine and a half. Look, 
the fact that the the spread is seven and a half when almost seventy five percent of the bets are on Arizona, and that the books aren't moving off of seven and a half means that they are loving that the public is taking Arizona. And I think if that's the case, that Kansas State's they think Kansas State's going to win by more than seven. I think there has to be a lot of points. So that's why I'm over 59 and a half. Uh, and I think Kansas State's defense can get better and, and, and Arizona's still explosive enough to where they're going to score enough. So if Kansas State's going to win maybe by even double digits, I think Kansas State has to have a lot of points too. So that's where I'm at there. Plus, I am thinking that this offense is ready to make a splash, a, almost a reintroduction of sorts. Maybe it's this week. All right. Well, the reason why I uh, I was I have thoughts on it is because I'm going the opposite way of you. I'm oh. taking the under. Uh, I am I am zagging where everybody zigs. I actually think that there's a scenario where this is a low scoring game for K State in Arizona. Number one, saw Arizona play a tiny scoring game last week with Northern Arizona, and I also think that while we know that K State the offense has seemingly been in its best when it's been a little quick and, and moving along. Uh, I also think there's an element to this game where they will be aware that the best thing for them would be maybe if you do strike early, you can try to use that run game and kind of play that clock a little bit more than you would in other games because I, and I think they would do this even if uh, they, they hadn't struggled in the secondary last week against Tulane, but Combine that with the fact that you are facing McMillan and Fafita together. That's a scary sight. Um, I think you might want to try and keep them off the field as long as possible. There's also the scenario where both teams struggle in terms of both offenses have been questionable at times early in this season, and both are dealing with discrepancies in their offensive line due to injury that they wouldn't normally uh, have going on. So because of what my score prediction ended up being for this game, uh, I, I take the under because my score prediction, it may be horribly wrong, but uh, it's it's well under the total of 59 and a half. Uh, so we'll see how that ends up working out for uh, for K-State here. Okay. Well, on our on our parlay we put together, I guess we, we can't come to that consensus. So we'll have to go somewhere else. Maybe Avery yeah. touchdown. Uh, yeah, that might not be a, uh, a bad idea at all. All right, let's get back into K-State in Arizona. Get ready to close this thing out. If K-State is to pull out the victory against the Wildcats on Friday, who is your offensive and defensive MVP? Uh, just kind of give it away a little bit there. Avery Johnson on offense. I think he has, the, if they have a coming out party, I think he, he's probably the, the head of the snake, obviously. And I look back on what that quarterback with a similar skill set for New Mexico did against Arizona. Uh, had a big game. I think this is one where Avery could really – take over and give Arizona fits because they seem to not be totally equipped maybe for that style of quarterback play. Okay. Uh, defensively, where do you go? Yeah, I, mean, I guess I haven't I thought a whole lot, lot about this yet, but I, I, I think it's when we talk to stop the passing game. I think, I think those two are that good. Noah Fafita and Ted Rowe McMillan and, if you you could try to to stop it, I think it's going to take off anyway. But if you were going to, you would probably do it with a pass rush um, just to disrupt the timing because I think you can be really good at corner and still that's going to be a tough task for you. So I think the way to throw that off or defend it isn't really just to say we're going to double team this guy or we're going to cover this guy like a blanket. That is way easier said than done. I think you do it with a pass rush. So give me, uh, boy, a pass rusher here. What do I want? How about? I um, mean, I'm really trying. How about Travis Bates? Just off the okay. wall. Okay, I like yeah. that. I I like that a lot because, because he's an interior pass rusher too. That they, they use him on some of the jet stuff. Yeah. Um, and they're going to have replacement players on the interior of the offensive line. Yeah, nope. I absolutely like that because I've been impressed with Travis Bates uh, throughout parts of this season. You mentioned his versatility, uh, and also like that's just a guy that I don't know that people have recognized or realized prior to the season starting. But when you see him out there on the field, he looks massive compared to everybody else. 
He's just a tall, big dude. Weird. So. Weird. I guess uh, they got a few weird, uh, weird. That's probably an operative word there, but <laughs> weird numbers. I think people get what you're saying. Numbers too. No, I was talking about numbers. Like yeah, okay. Brennan Mott plays the line at 38. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chidi Obi Eisor, I think, is eight. eight. Yeah. Um, Travis Bates is 39. So yeah, yeah. So they're uh, they're loaded up there. All right, my offense is my offensive MVP for K State in this game. Everybody has been clamoring for more of it. Chris Kleiman has said, yeah, we got to do something more with it. And when you're looking for for weapons and trying to get Avery comfortable in the passing game more so, yeah, it would be great if Keegan Johnson and Jace Brown put together weeks one and two and in their best form and did them together. Um, maybe somebody else steps up, like maybe Dante Cephas finally catches a ball. Um, I don't know. You got to go Dylan Edwards, though. I think Dylan Edwards is the way to to get this thing done because they're obviously being conscious about needing to give him more opportunities there. So we know that he can do it in the run game. He can be a weapon in the passing game. It's on them now to figure out the way to get him the ball to be able to do that. Uh, I think he could be the game changer. And, and I don't say a guy like DJ Giddens because we know DJ Giddens is going to go out and be great and just give you what he gives you. But – you have to have those types of guys that are going to have kind of that special type of play. Uh, and obviously the connection with Avery and, and Dylan would set up that way. So I go with Dylan Edwards. I mean, that that's going to be a, probably a, a pretty good pick every week. I mean, if you have three touchdowns yeah. on however many touches you're, you're, you're I think, I think on two touches, threat. three touchdowns on two touches currently. Yeah. He's a big time threat. Uh, my defensive pick in this game I mean, at some point, the man has to step up and be a hero. He's got to show off the newfound hands. Marquis Siegel has to step up and not only make plays, but also just kind of be a leader to help him and his safeties get their crap together. Because Siegel was, by I think, probably the best of the three safeties on he, Saturday against Tulane. I mean, he was actually it, – it seems weird to say this, but he might have been – He's one of the best defensive players on a team through two weeks still. Like, like I know it's wild, and I'm, I'm, I'm writing about it as we speak, but Marky Siegel and Jacob Parrish were actually really, really good on Saturday. Now, yeah. that, that does narrow down who was the culprits of, <laughs> of, of the uh, gashing that they took, well, but those and, two were good right now. And we talked about it with, like, Jordan Riley at different points. Like, the line for him to go from being a massive problem in that two-lane game to being a guy that – was really good, very thin. Yeah. very thin, because he he tied Austin Romaine for the team lead in tackles. He was good in that department. And a lot of times, or at least a few times, he was in the neighborhood of where he needed to be to make the play. He just didn't do the right thing in that moment, <laughs> most notably that touchdown pass that uh, Mensa threw. Yeah. Half. He uh, that was probably, yeah, that was probably Mensa's worst pass of the day, and it goes for yeah. a touchdown. Um, I mean, he was – Surrender cobring while the ball yeah. was in the air. He knew he screwed up. Jordan Riley's going to make the play. I think because the off- defense is still new to him, first year it means transfer. I don't think you trust his eyes yet. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll have to see. I mean, that would be that would be the big brain play by me is just to say that uh, Jordan Riley flips it all and puts it together right now uh, and and has that Chris Kleiman transfer DB breakout non-conference game and does it against Arizona, it would certainly be welcome, but I'll go with uh, the safety pick. I, I tried to give him good juju. Uh, we did our post-game, um, post-game pre- or pre-game show uh, for uh, Three Mall. I couldn't even come up with the name of my own podcast there. Three Mall, and I, and I wear our home field shirts, and I always wear a different one. I wore the chirp chirp ball state jersey or jersey shirt today to kind of to kind of throw some good juju as well. We'll see if it works. Yeah, we will see uh, if that ends up working out. Uh, real quick note here for you, DY, on your pick of over 59 and a half for K State Arizona. Uh, a K State non conference power five opponent, a game with them has not gone over 60 points or hit 60 points in over a decade. So Missouri, the last two years, 57-52. Stanford, 31. Mississippi State, back-to-back years, 55-41. Vandy, 21. Good God. Stanford, 39. Uh, Let's see. Then uh, Auburn was 34. The last one to do it, 
It's 2012. Obviously, you were not on the beat yet. Do you know which game that was? The total was 65 in this non-con Power 5 matchup for K-State, 2012. No, I mean, that was the year they won the Big 12, obviously. I know that with Colin Klein, but I don't know. Who they, did they Was that the year that you guys talked about the Miami game? I don't know. Yes, that is one of the Miami games that gets talked about. Both Miami games in 2011 and 2012 get talked about a lot. They were both awesome for very different reasons. Uh, 2011 was a grind, but they got the stop of Ja'Cory Harris at the one-yard line, and that basically set up everything that happened from 2011 on. But, yes, 65 points because K-State beat the crap out of Miami, 52-13 to 13, uh, in Bill Snyder Family Stadium. So, And real quick, I would share this. Uh, I was thinking about this earlier in the week, and if we're talking about, I don't know, looking for maybe some parallels to uh, positivity <laughs> would maybe be the, the best way to put it. 2011 K-State, which ended up being a 10-2 and two team, they were 7-2 and two in conference play um, and worked their way up into the top 25 pretty quickly and everything that came with it. Beat some good teams, had some good moments, and then set the stage for 2012. It's good probably to remind people that that offense that ended up scoring quite a few points throughout the course of the season and being pretty good only beat Eastern Kentucky 10-7. to uh, They did turn around and beat Kent State 37-0, and then they beat Miami 28-24. to uh, So... If you're looking for, hey, the offense has started slow, two, three games does not mean the offense is going to be slow the entire season. It can take some time to get everybody acclimated, similar to that team where you had a new quarterback, you're working out new weapons, trying to get it all figured out. 2011 got it figured out. 2024, I think they can also get it figured out uh, and and set things up for a a big two- to three-year stretch here for K-State football. So that's a little positive note for everybody there. Uh, final thing, prediction time, K-State, Arizona, Friday night on Fox. Where are you going? As I said, I think there's going to be a good amount of points. So I'm point heavy. I was going to say you and all your points. Where are you finding them? Points. I will say that Arizona's going to score. Kansas State's going to score more. I got to win because it is a short week. It is a road team. My Kansas State's at home. It's a short week. Short weeks benefit home teams. And Arizona is also going on the road for the first time with this coach. Can also be yeah. something different. They are also playing here for the first time. There is a lot of newness. So even if they might be the more experienced team, they have a lot of inexperience with what they are about to do. So I think Kansas State can win that kind of game. I'll say 38 28. Okay. There you go. 66 points there for Derek Young, who expects a lot of points in this game and not P-O-Y-N-T-Z. He's talking the real points. Uh, I take the Cats, the Purple Cats. 27-24 is my pick here uh, for a lot of those same reasons. Number one, I do think K-State is the better team, and I know that everybody's a little panicked about it, but I I compared it uh, the other day to it's kind of like the, you know, the coach's kid situation where the coach is always harder on his kid when he's coaching the team because he's closer to it and like, okay, I, you know, I have higher expectations and standards for you. K-State through the first two weeks of the season, if you look around, there's not just other teams in the Big 12 that would sign up for what K-State has done. There are teams in the top 25 that would sign up for what K-State has done. I can guarantee you Oregon would love to have what K-State has done through the first two weeks of the season. Because, I mean, if you think about Oregon, their game against Boise State, they end up putting up, what, uh, was it 40 points that they ended up scoring, I think? 37. Uh, 37. 14 of those came off of a kick and a punt return for a touchdown. So their offense is still not scoring for the Ducks. They would take what K-State's offense has done through these first two weeks of the year. I think K-State gets it figured out, and uh, everybody's just a little harder on it because of the expectations, because they're yours. There are a lot of other teams that have had struggling starts. Arizona has not had the most fun starts. I'm sure their fan base is in the same boat. They also probably think they're going to show up and get beat by however much on Friday night. I think these are two fan bases that need to realize you both have very good teams. They're going to get it figured out. K-State being the home team on a Friday night, they're going to be the ones that get it figured out this week. So the Cats win at 27-24 is my pick uh, for Friday night. K-State and Arizona from Bill Snyder Family Stadium. That will do it for us. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Head on over to On3, get more preview of the K-State-Arizona matchup 
over at On3 and KSO. And you can also take a look at Drew carefully curating all of the visitors that will be in town for this game because it's a lot more than what you'd expect for a Friday night. I know high school football going on for a handful of people, but there are a lot of recruits that are actually going to be there relative to the expectation. Plenty of other stuff there as well. And then come back to the KSO YouTube page after the game on Friday. You get your press conference from Chris Kleiman and players, as well as the instant reaction highlights and much more recapping K-State Arizona. First top 20 matchup inside Bill Snyder Family Stadium since 2014 when K-State unfortunately fell to Auburn. That changes on this Friday. Cats, cats, come on.